Well, hello, friends. Thank you for joining me today. And I am very excited about my next guest, who's also from Ireland. A guy who's a wonderful speaker and promoter of the divine will for many years. Yes, I'm joined by Daniel Shields. Hello, Daniel. Hey, Carol. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. I know that we promoted our Divine Will Day in Derry last year, a year and a half ago, that was very successful. And you were actually part of that team who spoke. However, you were also part of the team that spoke last Friday, 31st of May, with Sam Kaduri, who is a Divine Will teacher here at Being Catholic Media. You spoke for his consecration to the Divine Will. That was very successful again. And after listening to that, I had to get you back on here. So thank you for coming on today. I know you're busy with life in the divine will. Yeah. So thank you for joining me. It's great to be here, Carol. It really uh, is. You're from Derry, Northern Ireland, my own country. Yeah. Well, friends, as I said, uh, Daniel did a talk last Friday, 31st of May. It was an hour long talk about the divine will, his experience of the divine will. And I've listened to it four, to it four times. So I felt it was only appropriate that I get him on here to have a conversation with myself about this gift. Daniel, first of all, introduce yourself to our audience. You have been obviously in the divine will for a long time, right? You've been over 20 years, right? Yeah, I was introduced to the divine will in the year 2005, studying theology at Maryville uh, by a good friend, Annette Bradley. And... Um, uh, the Lord had been preparing me for quite a few years for it, you know, since my reconversion back to the faith in around 2002. And I can tell you, I wasn't expecting, you know, you read the lives of the saints and so forth, but you know yourself once you start reading the volumes, my goodness. Whoa. Yes, yes, yes. It's absolutely phenomenal. Now, you just give us a bit of, a, I guess, a backdrop, Daniel, to your, to your history, because I think people need to put it into context as to how you discovered this, because... You have a great disposition, I will say this, friends, for understanding the volumes of what you call the knowledges, which I absolutely love. Yeah. But your own story is 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 quite unique, right? Well, it seems to be when you reflect on it and listen to other people's stories, because God works in a unique way with everyone. Yeah. And, you know, even as a child, I uh, I didn't actually realize it. Um, the Lord used to pop in out of my life every so often. And um, would you would call them the cusions, maybe? Um and have the odd word with me. I never thought anything much of it until later on years. I I, um, I sort of came out, when I came back to the faith and started reading the lives of the saints and so forth and looking back at my journey in life. Um, and then these locutions started happening again and, you know, periodically. They weren't on a regular basis, but periodically. Mm -hmm. And um, and I seen this sequence of events that God had a plan for my life and to me, that was knowledge because, you know, when you're, I don't know about yourself, you know, everybody's uh, knowledge is different. Uh, their life experience is different. But I thought I was just here because by chance, you know, my mom and dad got married and I was here. I didn't realize that God had a plan for me. Yeah. You know, as yeah. Was with everyone. Yeah. Um, to me, that was, not, that was, that was, that was, that was enlightening, you know. So I take uh, it then in your home, Daniel, was, was the Catholic faith very much alive in, in Derry yeah, as well. Yeah, my dad and devout Catholics, we prayed the rosary, went to mass, but nobody ever told me why. You know, I think right. uh, it's a common thing. Did. You know, yes. nobody tells you there's like a divine science behind this. You know, it's to flood the soul with grace to help you become a virtuous person so that you can live out your vocation in life, whether it's married life, single life, or religious life. You know, and you become a more, as Aquinas would say, you become more fully human the more you share in the divine life of Christ, you know? Yes, that's the um, one thing. I, yeah, I love what you say there, Daniel, because there is a divine science behind it. The divine will is a science itself. Indeed, I was given a message from a friend of mine when our lady was talking about the science of the divine will. It is quite phenomenal. But yourself and how you discovered, I guess, the divine will, was it introduced to you through somebody or was it through your, uh, I guess, your theology studies in Maryville that you came across? Well, as I shared in the testimony of the talk you listened to, and that's the first time I've ever really done that testimony, you know, I've shared bits and pieces while I was teaching over the years, but I've never really sat down. Uh, and there's a much more to that testimony, but it was only, it was confined in hour, so I had to condense it. But, um, so I had an, a, mystical, a mystical experience in Lourdes back in 2002, as I came back to the sacraments and 
I didn't know that was a divine will experience until some years later I started reading the volumes and I looked back and I said, that's what that was about, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, as I shared in the testimony, when I received the Eucharist at the Grotto uh, at Mass, uh, my my whole being, be- an entire being became illuminated. I could see our Lord in my hands and my feet, my mind, my whole being. Not only could I see him, I could feel his divine life flowing through my whole being. My whole being became, in a sense, I felt divinized, although I didn't have that language at that time to, to express it in such a way. But it was absolutely remarkable. I thought I thought I I thought I was in heaven. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, when I on the following day, um, I had an experience where I seen creation, and I didn't know it at the time. How Adam was perceiving creation before the fall, where every created reality was just dripping with divine grace. It was alive. It was actually it speaks to us, and 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 the terms of love. Every created reality around me was loving me, and my soul was just being drowned in love. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, it was like a, a, yeah. a mini ecstasy if you want to put it that way so when I got the volumes uh, some years later and I started reading them and I looked back it was like a Lord speaking to me in my heart as I shared in the testimony how Adam was perceiving creation before the fall and this is how I was allowing you to experience it and if you allow me through this gift I will take you back there yes yes now, prior to this Daniel you were saying uh, we will share Daniel's testimony Um on our channel as well but just to I guess your life when you went to Lourdes at that time you had been away from the sacraments life had probably gone a bit pear-shaped for you right you weren't living in a state of grace and yet God revealed himself to you in Lourdes in a dramatic way yeah and this is what's so profound about it um, yeah is that I don't even think I was a confession properly but yet the Lord came down touched me in such a way as, as if he eradicated everything but and then you, when you read the volumes, and I and I think you would agree with this, and I keep saying this no matter where I go to teach this, you know, um, as best I can, that you have no idea how much God loves you unless you're studying the volumes. That's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. We we get we get we get glimpses of it in the scriptures. Yeah. yeah. But the volumes opens it up in a way that goes. Whoa, you yeah. know. I will say that. I don't think, and I've discussed this uh, on other podcasts that I have done, I have only really learned to discover this unfathomable, as uh, St. Faustina talks about, mercy and love of God, since I began to read the volumes. Because up to this point, I guess, through church history, we have been told that God loves us. You know, we want God's we want God's will for our lives, but we've never been able to actually actualize it. And Louisa, thank God for this beautiful servant of God, has allowed us to experience this, because as I have said before, I been I went to Medjugorje. I was only discovered divine will two years ago, um, but I can't get enough of it, and. I went to Medjugorje and I said, Our Lady, there's something else I'm missing. There's this yeah. something else I'm missing I'm not getting. I'm out here. What have you got for me? And that week I was invited, Katie Hurstage out in Medjugorje, my dear friend, had invited me to a prayer meeting on divine will. Yeah. And I thought, cha-ching, this is it. This is the final yeah. push. Well, and this is it. Yeah, now that you say that, Carol, I had a very similar experience. After that experience in Lourdes, I came back for about two weeks and I thought it was in heaven. Um, and then this, if you want to express it in, in mystical theology terms, this dark night of the soul came on upon me. And I'll tell you, it was pretty heavy stuff. But, uh, of course, I need a purified, you know. So, but I, I had such a thirst for adoration. I was going to adoration uh, about two or three or four hours a day. Um, going to mass twice a day, praying the rosary. I just has this supernatural zeal for the faith, and it was like the closer I got to God, it was like God was showing me how broken I was. I remember I used to even when I was in adoration, sometimes it didn't happen all the time, but periodically, that I would have closed my eyes and the Lord was showing my inner faculties, my intellect, memory, and will how broken they were. Right, and I remember even saying this uh, one time when I was studying the- theology out loud, and, and the lecturer looked at me and thought it was a bit off the reels. I says, "I was like, I was expressing something. I was saying there has to be something more." And he says, "What do you mean something more, Dan? The sacraments and 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 and, and it's when I studied the theology of the divine will, then I realized, right, 
and, and you have to you have to hear this properly. The sacraments lack nothing. But there's something in me was broken that not even the sacraments could fix. And what is that? Like it was the divine will missing from the human will. Okay, because I was I was going to mass twice a day, I was receiving the sacrament, but the, the closer I got to the Lord, the more I felt there was something in me so broken. And then when I started reading the volumes, I said, that is what's missing. The gift of God's divine will. The sacraments heal us, prepare us to receive the gift. But the sacraments in themselves, because our God, the Lord hasn't ordained it that way, that the sacraments don't give us the gift. It's the knowledges. Okay. And the desire for the gift. But you need the knowledge to know what you're receiving. Yeah. Yeah. And then once I once I started studying the knowledges and then doing the acts over a period of time, that awful void I felt in my soul started to go to sleep. It started to disappear bit by bit. Mm -hmm. It was a gradual process over a number of years. Mm -hmm. And until I felt this constant palpitating love within my heart that never left. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was like a gift of the divine will. Mm -hmm. And it was like this, it's like our Lord. I just read this a few days ago, Carol, where our Lord says, with the human will. It's as if even when the soul does it good, it realizes that there's still something missing. St. Paul talks about this in Romans 7. The good I know I should do, I didn't do, I don't do, yeah. and the things I know I should yeah. do, I don't do. This yeah. interior war. Well, yeah. it's the knowledge is with the axe, pit this warty sleep. You're always something of it remains a little bit of it. And our Lord calls that the tinder to ignite the fire, to keep us moving because we know we still are not and full perfection with God, and we never will this side of eternity. Yeah. But the gift of the divine will in itself allows us with this gift to operate with unheard of graces, you know, and that's a whole talk in itself. Yeah. Know? I know there's so many facets to the divine will. It is a way of life. It's a way of living. But I want to touch on, Daniel, with just something that you mentioned there. These are absolutely very, very profound knowledges. I mean, you know, they absolutely blow my mind every time I read them. But it is a gift. And we talk about, you know, you hear in Divine World Circles, how the soul has to be, I guess, disposed to this. I know you talked about this before. It's so important that we, our souls are disposed to it. We're ready for it. Because not everybody on the Catholic road will be able to get it. Because we get a lot of comments that go, oh, this is too much. You know, I, you know, I can't get my head around this, etc. But it is, it does require from us a certain level of disposition, right? Definitely. And I would say our Lord says this, because even Louisa, you know, they may have been doctors of the church or whatever, very, uh, you know, theologians who would have come to visit her because, you know, there was a lot of talk of she was a great saint, even when she was alive. And then she used to ask her Lord when they left, because she would have shared the knowledge, some of the knowledge of the divine will, they would have read a few of her volumes because a lot of her volumes were still in her room at that time. And our, our Lord says, their wills are not purified enough. They may be doctors in this area, you know, or great theologians, but their wills are not purified enough. But he goes on to express what is needed to receive the gift. It must be approached in humility. It must be approached with faith, if you believe that it's coming from God, and it's true. And the, this is the main ingredient, desire. Yeah. If you have the desire, and I always say this to people, when you're presented with the gift of the knowledge of, of the divine will, okay, it'll show your spiritual life up for where you are at that point in time. Yeah. Is your spiritual life really about you or how much glory you can give to God and what you can do for him, such as saving souls, freeing souls from purgatory, bringing the angels and the saints, their heavens to their completion and so forth, you know? This is all the graces that are tied in with the gift of the divine will. Yeah. And if you have a real zeal for God and for and have that spirit, as soon as you hear this, unless you know, as soon as you hear this, you're gonna you're gonna go with it. Because I did, I says, I can accomplish this, I can accomplish, and I can do this for the Lord. I says, I can give me more of this. And I, it was like there was a, a fire at night in my soul. I was reading the volumes. It took me six months to read the volumes. And I I no sooner had them finished, I started again. This went on for a number of years. I knew it was a special grace. You know, that um, and now I, it takes me maybe a couple of years to read 36 volumes because once you start reading a paragraph, you're lost in it because they're they're so deep. So deep. You know? So deep. You have to put them down. I find, you know, I, I find myself personally, I just sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament and read them because I get the quiet, no distraction because they are so profound. They, they require your full attention. 
But on, I just want to touch on something you said there, which is, of course, about being a gift. People think that if it's a gift, it's for me. You know, what am I going to get out of it? This is the human disposition. You know, it's a natural thing. God, if I do this, will you do this for me? You know, but it's it's not like that. That I guess for me, the divine will is about those things. It's about giving glory to God. All about that. The divine will itself is about reestablishing the order, the way things are supposed to be. So speak into that a little bit in terms of the gift itself, what it means well, for us. Yeah, the gift is, think about this. I always say, if you want to understand the gift of the divine will, any work of God outside of himself, creation, redemption, sanctification, whatever it may be, it helps to understand the inner life of the Trinity. And within the Trinity, there's no thought of self because they burn with love. The Father is constantly contemplating the Son, and the Son is contemplating the Father. And in this contemplation of each other, there's an eternal birth from that, which is the Holy Spirit. So in order for us to return to our original, to the order, the place, and the purpose that God created us, which is one of the titles of the book of heaven, mm -hmm. it's um, the, there's, we must become more like the Trinity, no thought of self, because that's what love is. Love is diffusive. It thinks about the well-being of everyone else. It's not self-centered, okay? It, 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 it's, it's directed out, you know, and, and then you know yourself, the love of God and the love of neighbor has lived out to its highest potential with the gift of the divine will. Again, with and you, you think about it, reading the hours of the Passion, I remember there's so many benefits that come and are fruits and, um, and privileges attached to reading the hours of the, or the study and or meditating in the hours of the Passion and working on that particular gift is that, Think about this. This is just one aspect of it. Our Lord says when you're praying the hours of the passion in, in, in the divine will, he says it, it's, it's as if he is on the earth praying them prayers again. He says the light that streams from them prayers flow into purgatory. Now listen to this. And transform their pains into light. That is huge. Yeah. Think about it. You're not only sanctifying them souls and, and, and speeding up their, their entry into the beatific vision, but you're transforming their pains into light because the divine will in itself, no matter where it goes or touches, has the creative power to transform anything that it touches. Mm -hmm. We see that in the Eucharist. It touches a piece of bread. All of a sudden, the fullness of life of the Trinity is there. It touches a human act, and a human act is transformed into the fullness of life of the Trinity. I know it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal, and I find you know. So your life, in terms of how has the, how it has affected you, obviously these knowledges, as you call them, which which is exactly what they are, divine knowledges. I guess your life has been changed. I can imagine from the inside out. How is Daniel now compared to the Daniel years ago since reading these volumes? Well, I tell you, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, Did you, how long have I got? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. So, but sometimes when I reflect on how much the knowledge has transformed your thinking, even yeah. you know how you perceive and interact with creation and people. You know, think about this. Faustina puts it so beautifully. I'm not saying I do this all the time perfectly by by uh, by by any means. I don't. But she says, uh, a soul truly in love with God will approach every person and its duties as it approaches the blessed sacrament. Now that's humanly speaking impossible. Yeah, there has to be a, a, an, a an interior transformation, because our Lord says, "What the knowledges will do." This is huge language. He says, "The knowledges will make the soul become by nature, or sorry, by grace, what God is by nature." Yeah, yeah. It's the likeness returned to the soul, the images and the intellect, the memory and the will. That is never that is we've never lost that even after the fall, but we lost the likeness, what it is to be like God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Such as think about this, you know. Yeah. As soon as you fuse in the divine will, the gift of by location to be wherever God is. Mm -hmm. I remember saying this to a priest one day, and it was too much for him because he, he wasn't familiar with the divine will. And I said, you know, Father, the Lord wants us to, because th this particular priest had a charism for Eucharistic adoration, and he was a very holy man. And I says, Lord, or Father, I says, the Lord wants to take us even beyond Eucharistic adoration. And he goes, what do you mean, Dan? I said, it wants us to be in the host with him. Yeah. It's my blowing. Not only one host, all hosts. All of them. Yeah. So we're loving, adoring them on an eternal, infinite, eternal scale with his will. Yeah. 
Mm. That's a heavenly language. You know, you know yeah. when I remember, even before I, I received the, this gift of knowledge, I used to, the Lord was working with me and preparing me. I used to look before the tabernacle and I used to think about St. Michael. He's in charge of all the angels and the saints in heaven. He's the forefront of the battle. He's in charge of the souls in purgatory. He, he's at the presence of every tabernacle throughout the world and all the other duties he does. I was sitting thinking, well, how can that be? How can it be in all these different places simultaneously doing all this type of work? Yeah, yeah, of course. Was, locating, yeah. And what is the Lord saying to us? Yeah. With the gift of the divine will. It's heaven present on earth in the soul. Yeah. It's the soul becoming like God. The Lord is empowering us. Now, it's God doing the work. But with his will, he's empowering us to live out this life of the Trinity on earth as God wants us to live it out. Oh. To constantly so generate eternal life. At every instant. Yeah. It's incredible. It's like, it's like you have a perpetual mass in your soul. <laughs> <laughs> it's profound. <laughs> it's so profound. My God. One of the things you mentioned before, which totally got me as well, friends, and you'll appreciate this, is that we limit God. We limit God. Daniel, speak into that. Because we do. We try to put him into our own mindset. You know, but ultimately, yeah. this gift allows us to, I guess, in some way, free ourselves from our own limitations and allow God and to work within us in an even greater way. Yeah. And, you know, I used to say this. Uh, it was an, an analogy came into my mind one day when I was uh, facilitating a meeting. I, says, I looked at the, the, the people in front of me and I said, you know, what, do you know what we did to God at the fall? I says, forgive the crude analogy. We like put handcuffs on him. And we've been told them, we've been telling them ever since, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And what our Lord is saying, and you, you'll read this in volume 12 and a number of the volumes where our Lord says, freedom, freedom, freedom at last. There is no, no there's no longer no limitations. I can multiply my divine life as much as I want through a soul and the divine will and all the other things he wants to do. He says, you have the freedom, fill heaven. Think about this, fill eternity. Fill eternity with love. Fill eternity with divine life. I have put no limitations. Yeah. That's what it is to receive the gift of the divine will. There is no longer limitations because as brilliant and as infinite and perfect and eternal as the holy sacrifice of the masses, our Lord still complains because he can only multiply his life in a few hosts. Yeah. According to the number of hosts that are in the Saborium. And he says many times that life is subject to abuse. Not in all cases, but in many cases. He says, with the gift of the divine will in the soul, he keeps the soul free in a sense that nothing can be offended in any way, and he can multiply his divine life as much as he wants. Incredible. And I wonder, it's a gift for now. I want you to just speak into that. Why now, Daniel? Why do you, is it because our world is in such a state? We just, we know, well, our church is, in the, is not in the greatest of places. You know, the clergy, we don't have enough of them. God bless. We just don't have... And again, the Lord is allowing us to multiply all our acts so we can, well, again, make up for all of this, right? Of course. Uh, now, the, the gift has not just been returned at this point in time because of the state of the world. Sure. It was always God's design anyway. It was common. Well, it just happened to be at this point in time when God has given it. Okay. Now, if the world was still in a fairly good state, God still would have given the gift. But of course, it's a pivotal point in time to give the gift because it's bound, balancing all of God's infinite attributes with yeah. all the crimes that are being committed. Okay, yeah. simultaneously, what does our Lord say? Uh, uh, or St. Peter say in the scriptures, one act of love covers a multitude of sin. Okay, now we're sending God infinite eternal seas of divine love and glory and adoration and so forth on behalf of all of humanity. And that's making reparation for so much sin. And a sense, even our Lord says to Louisa on one occasion, he says to her, if it wasn't for you, I, I would have annihilated the earth. Yeah. You know, I, had a, I, I think I shared this in my testimony. I can't remember if I did or not. You know, I, I remember one time I had a mystical experience where the Lord allowed to see the gift of the divine will in my soul. And because it was in me, right, I was simultaneously bilocated into every dimension of love throughout time and in eternity. So when God looked down at the earth, my soul was bilocated. I could, I could consciously see this. My soul was bilocated under every dimension of love throughout the entire cosmos. And as the Lord looked down at heaven, because the divine will was in me, I was bilocated everywhere. All he could see was heaven present on earth mm -hmm. in the entire world. That's, that, 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 that's just ridiculous language. 
Yes, I know, I know. And to some people looking, they might find they may look. Oh my goodness, how will we, how will I ever achieve this? But it's open to everybody who desires it. That's the thing. It's open to everybody. So in terms of your own life now, you know, I guess this is really an interior job. This whole divine will. I've always said it since I discovered it only a couple of years ago. It's all about changing our interior lives and indeed simplifying our lives, right, Daniel? I guess. In terms of your own life, is do you live a very simple life? Do you how well, do you I, sometimes come I, up and pray? Take us through your day in terms of so people watching will know how they can, you know, how they can pray, how they can act each day in order to to, to discover more about this gift. Well, that the Lord has still given me that. I'm a by nature, I'm a bit of an extremist. You know, no matter what I do, I sort of seem to apply. So, you know, I'm not telling people to go to Mass twice a day, but I have a real love for the Mass. So I go to Mass twice a day. I get up in the morning. I spend a bit of time doing rounds and, and so forth. That's my first act of the day. I spend a, I spend a period of time in that. I go to Mass. I come back. Even when I'm in the gym, this is a beautiful thing about the Divine Will. No matter where you're at, you're transforming everything you do, touch and affect throughout time and in eternity in the Divine Love. If I'm training, I constantly think about the Lord and I'm loving him in it through every rep. I do with weights or whatever it may be. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm reordering the lives of all people who trained physically past, present, and future for their own egoism. <laughs> so you're, you're constantly reordering all things. And you do this spontaneously without needing a prayer book, you know, as you as you, you become familiar, familiar with this type of language. Then I would go home and, and then I would have a bit of lunch and then I would go away and do a little bit of adoration, do a little bit of study and reading for a bit. And then I would come back again and go to prepare to go to Mass. And then I spend, uh, I would relax in the evening and maybe finish off with a bit of prayer and reading and so forth. Very simple life. Very simple uh, life, yeah. yeah it's very, you, you know, this is the beautiful thing about the divine will. I often hear people saying, I'm too busy, I can't incorporate it into my life. And I would say to anybody, Carol, starting out with the gift of the divine will, all right, there's so many ways of working the gift and you can be lost in it. And it can actually scare people. But I would say, just keep fusion. We call fusion asking for the gift. And just do everything else you do in the day in the divine will. Yeah. Then over a period of time, as you get used to that, you can build on that, introduce the hours of the passion, whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. So simply to teach this, teach this to a child. So anybody, it's a, anybody that says, I am too busy, you know, that, that's not good enough. You know, and yeah. maybe it's been presented to them in the wrong light, so maybe it's not their fault. Because some people think, well, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that. You know, like I was living in the divine will, and I didn't even know it for a number of years before the Lord gave me the knowledge that I was living in it. Yeah, yeah. So you were actually doing it without knowing you were doing it. Yeah, I, I was having these different experiences, Carol. Yeah. And it was only again when I got the knowledge uh, of the, the gift and I looked back and I could see, Lord, I was having them experiences because the gift of the, the divine will was in my soul. Yeah, yeah. I just want to, again, just touch on a little bit about air will versus God's will. Because there are some people out there who will say, you know, God has given us free will. We have the right to choose. Therefore, when we enter into the divine will, we are essentially giving up our will. Some people can find that a little bit confusing. Perhaps you can speak into that a bit about what that actually means in terms of giving up our will, surrendering it, and what that means. Well, I think it's as simple as this, Carol. It's more about our own disordered desires. Yes. Rather than, you know, as I say, my life, like I go to the gym. Some people think, you know, when I'm away giving talks, you know, I'm sort of a wee bit well built, you know, people look and think, mm, he's not fast. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <He's> <laughs> not... Maybe, you know, you know? And, uh, and I would say just whatever <clears throat> you're doing, do it in the divine will. The divine will transform the act. Our Lord says, I don't care how great an exterior act is. If it's not animated by the internal light of my will, it doesn't have the infinite, perfect, and eternal value that I wanted to have. It's a human act. Okay. So as you say, it's 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 not about necessarily thinking that you have to be constantly fasting and doing this and that. Although yeah. the Lord does want us to continue on what he has taught us for all these years through the lives of the saints. Our human will does need tamed. We do need pits. It does need discipline, whether it's through ascetical practices, but a fast and, you know, whatever it may be. We need to pray. And, and as, as the scriptures say, pray at all times. Well, what, that doesn't mean to be on your knees. What that means is the constant disposition of thinking about God and seeing God in creative realities and seeing God in the people before you. 
Mother Teresa used to do that, receive the Eucharist, and then she says, I go out and treat everybody as if I'm working with Jesus. Yeah, yeah. That's praying at all times. It's changing your interior yeah. disposition, you mm -hmm. know? And that takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. But it does take sacrifice and work. Yeah. And I would say this, this is key. You know, I think the Lord has tied up this gift and the growth of this gift. This is my personal experience with the Eucharist. Yeah, the Eucharist, yeah. The Eucharist. You know, receiving Holy Communion worthily. Spend them moments after the Mass contemplating that immense reality of God in your soul. and uh, Because the Lord uses the gift of the Eucharist yeah. to expand the kingdom within our soul. And the same, we need the Eucharist to receive the Eucharist as God wants us to receive it. Mm -hmm. Because with the human will, the, the Lord can only give us crumbs from that infinite reality of himself and the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. But with the gift of the divine will, there's an infinite eternal capacity now within your soul where the Lord can pour immense seas of grace. And this is the beautiful thing, as we already talked, uh, and you made uh, reference to this, Carol, about the gift in itself. And it's this, it's we lose, we lose thought of self because but it's not just you're not receiving the Eucharist for yourself. It's what God wants to give to you, to the whole of the church in heaven, purgatory and earth through you as you receive the Eucharist. It's not always about ourselves, although it is about ourselves. Yeah. We become a conduit of grace for the entire church in heaven, purgatory, and earth. It truly is remarkable, friends. I want to encourage you, do not be put off by any of the what Daniel is saying, because it is very, very profound, this gift, but it's there for everybody if we simply desire it. And Daniel, what would you say to those people who may be watching, who feel it's not for them, or maybe, as you say, maybe we be frightened to feel, because there is a bit, some people are saying, you know, there are some people who feel that because the divine will is not fully, you know, the volumes are still, the final volumes are still going through their last viewing from the church and inspection. Encourage well, would, people. Well, I would say, you know, look, if anybody has a problem at the minute with the pause in Louise's canonization, yeah. that pause is necessary because Father Ian Lucy says himself, the volumes they translate it properly with the proper footnotes. Yes. Because the mother Gabriel says herself, I listened to her one of your talks. She says she was talking to one of the men, I think it's a senior, I can't remember his name, he's over the head of her cause. He says she will be beatified, but the church wants the translation done properly. That's why the pause is there, because they know it's going to explode throughout the world. Yes. And they don't, they don't want confusion. Yeah. Because if you're reading the volumes and you haven't read them in context of all the volumes, and what the church is teaching, it's very easy to misunderstand it. 100%, 100%. And, you know, I, I said one time, this is maybe a good thing because they can be done and done properly in the way that the Lord wants them. As the Lord says, he has to put that he has to, these have to go through my church, as the Lord tells us in the volumes. Yeah, he right. has to put them through the organ of the church. Yeah. So and it's only finish, right. Yeah. And just to finish your final the, the, the point you made there, you know, why think about this my goodness you know why and under the heavens would you not want to receive the fullness of the life that god has eternally created you for why would you want to wait to heaven to receive that why do you want to why would you not want to receive it here in our earth where you can do so much good to the entire world to the souls in purgatory to the angels and saints in heaven i, I just read this the other day for anybody hearing this for the first time it sounds uh, it sounds too good to be true i'll put it in them terms here I, 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 we had a meeting on Thursday night. We covered this at our meeting. Uh, I can't remember what volume it's from. Our Lady says, Our Lord was saying, when we unite with Our Lady, okay, in the divine will, her acts and our acts become one, okay? And as these acts are returned to the bosom of the Trinity, think about this, this is huge. Our Lady receives double glory for every time that takes place. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Mm -hmm. Every time my heart beats in the divine will or I breathe or I think of the divine will, our Lady's heaven is constantly increasing, 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 increasing. Why? And that's not just for Our Lady. That includes all the angels and the saints. It's phenomenal. Right? Now think about this. If anybody has a problem with that, they need to go and have a wee talk to themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who wants this. Yeah, because yes. we're, we are created to do good. And the Lord is saying to you now, I haven't put limitations on the good that you can do. I haven't placed limitations on the love that you can return to me. Yeah, incredible. 
I just want to, before we close, Daniel, just, just one thing. I could stay here with this guy all day, friends, just like I could listen to him all day. I just want you to share with me about stepping outside of that grace, because sometimes life, you know, is difficult, can be very challenging for us all. Before we know, we're caught in situations, in, you know, and that aren't so great. And life hits us. And we may feel that we have in some way fallen out of the grace of the divine will. You know, are there certain situations in life that can take us? Obviously, sin. We need to obviously go to, to confession, receive the Eucharist as much as we possibly can. But in terms of, you know, stepping outside of that grace where we're not in the divine will, speak into that a little bit. Well, first of all, to give people um, comfort, and our Lord tells us this in the volumes, unless you make a deliberate act of the will to leave through deliberate sin, right, or a deliberate act of the will, right, the Lord says, I perform all sorts of miracles to keep you in that eternal light. Wonderful. Isn't it? Yes. And it's really, because a lot of people, I was so confused at the start, Carol, I was going, am I in, am I out, am I what, am I this? That's it. But I, I would tell this to people. That's part of the journey, the confusion at the start, because okay. your whole life you have been trained to think a certain way. All of a sudden, the Lord has given you the gift of his will, which will slowly but surely transform your nature and your thinking. That takes time. There's a little confusion in that. Don't worry about that. That's just normal. That's part of the journey. Now, if we do commit a serious sin, right, then we go to confession and desire the gift straight away. And I would say this to anyone, if you can't get to confession, this is basic catechesis. If you can make a perfect act of contrition in your heart, even if you've committed a serious sin, God will return you and restore you to grace, yeah. using the gift of the divine will, and go to confessions as soon as you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we really, if we want, if we desire the gift, the Lord is saying to us, look, I will maintain you within the gift once you desire it. Again, do what we can do, attend the sacraments, and basically play our part as much as we possibly can. The Lord knows our limitations, our exactly. struggles, our weaknesses. Exactly. Okay? He, he has, think about this. He's really lived out the perfect version of our life. Yes. And he tells us, and this is a profound, you know, every time I see, study the volumes, like, like everyone, you're always seeing things in it you've never seen before. Our Lord says, even once you make a firm desire to live in the divine will, and you commitment, now he knows our hearts, whether, they're, whether, we're, whether we're sincere or whether we're not sincere. But once you make a sincere desire to live in the divine will, he bestows the grace on you as if you've lived your whole life in it. Yeah. Because he's really lived in the perfect version of your life. Yeah. And you know yourself, now I lived outside of God's grace for a number of years and lived a bit of crazy life. And the, the, the guilt trip that comes with that, because the enemy moves in and will always try to keep you in that area where God's mercy is not for you, uh, making you feel that unhealthy guilt. Okay? Um, but when you when when I when you read this, you know that that should put your heart such a, at such peace, because our Lord knows our sins from all eternity. All He is interested in, He says this to Louisa even in the higher volumes. He says to Louisa, even if you do make an, a, an exit from My will, I'm not interested. All I'm interested in is get you back. It's like the prodigal son, the father with the prodigal son, get back in, yeah, yeah, <laughs> get back yeah. to work. Yeah, because you know, yeah, God wouldn't, you know. Sin, Confess it, yeah. it's gone. <laughs> Get back to work. If you think about it, we, again, limit God, as you said earlier on. We have this, our own screwed up thinking, our, our own thinking, thinking that as soon as we do something, God's going to take this away. Yeah. Because, you know, but that's not the case at all. As we said earlier on, we serve a loving and merciful God. He's not going to give you a gift and take away because of, you know, something minor that happened in your life. He knows, our, as you say, he knows our weaknesses. He knows he knows our desires and he also knows our flaws. So why would he take it away from us? Yeah. And I think part of the problem there, Carol, is it's, it's our, our warped perception of God. This is it. Our limit, our, how we limit him. Yeah. Once you study the volume, then you will see a God, you know, it magnifies the scriptures. Okay, the intensity of God's love for us is beyond anything we can imagine. And I've only tasted drops of it, you know, yeah. them little experiences I've, I've had, because if you experience the full intensity of, of the love that God has for you, your soul would not remain in your body for an instant. You would be boom, out yeah. of here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know, friends, that when I read the volumes, I have to be quiet because it, it gives me so much joy. They're so sweet. 
that's how I would describe them. They penetrate my soul like nothing I've ever read before. I thought scripture couldn't get any better. And then you read the volumes, which which really, as you say, Daniel, the volumes magnify scripture and church teaching and the saints and all the rest to a whole new level, as I've said multiple times on this podcast. But I know, Daniel, I could stay here and talk to you all day. But I think people, after listening to you, like I did the last few days, I had to listen to you to several times because you're so well read on this gift. And I want to thank you for coming on today. You've been really fantastic. And I hope to have you right. back on again. Thank you, Carol. God bless you, love. Um, before we go, if they speak into anybody who's a little bit sitting on the side of the fence, who maybe find it challenging to believe in God or find he doesn't exist, I always try to close with a positive note for those who may be struggling right now or who feel that they do, God doesn't exist. Speak into that. Well, Carl, there was nobody as broken as myself. You know, I, I lived a crazy life. Uh, the sex, drugs, and the rock and roll, and all the rest of it, man. You know, uh, <laughs> it was a, it was, it was a, I was a proper head kiss, as Father Humphrey says in the introduction to my uh, testimony. <laughs> and I went to Lourdes. Now, I'm not saying you need to have these experiences, but I went to Lourdes, and God touched me in such a way that um, I'll, I'll put it, I'll, I'll give you this experience I had. About three days after I had that experience in Lourdes, okay. It was, it was, we were doing the tours of the sides of France. I was down in a, in a, in a port. Uh, I can't even remember where it was in some part of France. And again, that whole creation came alive. And all I can say to you is this, the cobblestones I was standing on, the air, everything was palpitating and speaking to me. It loved me. Then the ground opened up and I could see God showed me, put a light in my mind and showed me his, uh, 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 allowed me to experience his all-knowingness at some level. He showed me when he created the earth, where he placed that cobblestone in, the cent in a certain place in the earth, whatever many thousands or millions of years ago, whatever it was, that wasn't revealed to me. Knowing centuries ago, they would have men to dig that stone up, shape it and mold it for me to stand on that day. He knew that from all eternity. What the point was this, I was so broken as a human person, right? And what God was showing me in that was this, you have no idea how much I love you. The very stones that you're walking on, I'm thinking about them and hold them in existence out of love for you as if the only creature exists, as well no. as the entire cosmos. We haven't, we, as they say, we haven't a Scooby over here. We haven't a notion about that enormity, the sea of love. We are just, we have, we, we'd only understand a fraction, a, a tiny speck of dust, what God has for us. And, yeah. you know, this gift is, you know, Daniel O'Connor puts it this way. It's so simple, but yet so profound. And it is so true. You get it, but at the same time, there's so much to it. It's beyond us. Yeah. So it's, it's, God. it's the essence of God's being in your soul. Yeah, the essence of God. And on that note, friends, I want to encourage you, you know, we'll put some more up on Daniel. We'll be speaking more to Daniel as time goes on. I want to encourage you, be encouraged by what Daniel has to say. An absolutely mind-blowing testimony, um, Daniel, to say the least. And you are a great credit to the faith and a great credit to the gift itself. So thank you for coming on and speaking to me. Real pleasure. No, God bless you. Thank you. Okay, friends, thank you for joining me today. Until next time, God bless. And remember, God loves you. Bye-bye for now.